Of all the Primarch, save perhaps Mortarion, Lion L. Johnson stands apart. Partially, this is due to his taciturn nature. A brooding silence hangs over him at all times. Yet there is something more, something buried beneath his noble exterior. Perhaps this is a result of his upbringing, growing to maturity alone in the monster-ridden forests of Caliban. Even at a council of war, the lion moves like an apex predator. He's always watching, always planning, always hunting. He unnerves even his brothers. From Malkador the Sigilai. Lion L. Johnson, oftentimes referred to as the Lion during his lifetime, known also by the cognomen the First and the honorific Primaris Angelus Mortis, was the Primarch of the First Legion of Space Marines, the Dark Angels. As with much knowledge regarding the First Legion and its master, there was a vast body of rumor and little fact regarding the earliest years of the Primarch, Lion L. Johnson. Before the start of the Great Crusade, the gestation pod containing the infant Primarch that had been mysteriously teleported through the warp from the Emperor's subterranean gene laboratory beneath the Himalayan mountains landed on the feudal death world of Caliban in what would become the Segmentum Obscurus. Caliban was a planet whose surface was largely covered by immense forests, inhabited by terrible, monstrous beasts, mutated by the touch of chaos in the centuries after the birth of the Chaos God Slanesh, due to the planet's proximity to the nearby Eye of Terror. L. Johnson managed to survive in the forests alone, living as a wild man far from civilization. The planet was home to many knightly orders of warrior aristocrats created to defend its people and the massive fortress monasteries they live within to defend themselves from the great beasts. These knights maintained a few aspects of Caliban's ancient technology from before the Age of Strife and wielded primitive bold pistols and wore suits of simple power armor, very similar to that later used by the Legionis Astartes that were handed down from night to night. Despite these technological trappings, however, Caliban remained very much a pre-industrial society whose warriors rode to war on horseback. One of the most prominent knightly organizations was known simply as the Order and was made up of commoners and nobles alike, whereas the other knightly orders were drawn by tradition only from the Calibanite nobility. Over 150 Tehran years later, the young lion would be discovered by a hunting party of the Knights of the Order in the depths of Caliban's forests. Within these forests dwelt a breed of creature now unknown in the galaxy, monstrous chimeric weapons left over from the Age of Strife, driven by a hunger that could not be slaked and fully capable of rendering an armored warrior into a ruin of blood and flesh in seconds. How long the young Primarch had survived alone in the green deeps cannot be known for certain, for the lion himself seldom spoke of those times. The knights that found him assumed from his stature and bearing that he could not have spent more than a solar decade alone, but the growth and development of the Primarchs does not follow the pattern of mortal humans, and they do not age as do those untouched by the Emperor's genius. 
The span of standard years in which the lion prowled Caliban's sea of trees may well have been far longer than can be easily comprehended. Indeed, the legends of those fortified towns that bordered the stretch of forest where the Primarch was discovered spoke of a forest spirit that haunted the depths, a spirit of small stature but whose form was that of a man who was known only by the mysterious marks he left in his wake and had existed for nearly a standard century before the discovery of L. Johnson. Regardless of whether the lion had stalked the world forest of Caliban for a Tehran decade or a century, that time had left its mark upon him. The lightless depths beneath the forest canopy teem with horrors, rapacious killers that often emerge from the deeps to hunt among the towns and villages of Caliban's slowly dwindling human population. There, amongst the most foul monstrosities imaginable, the lion spent his childhood. He learned to keep silent, lest he grant advantage to those that stalked him. He learned to fight only when he could win, lest he be wounded too gravely to survive. And he learned that once battle was joined, it could only end in death. The strong would survive and the weak would fall. He fought for his life with nothing but his bare hands and a determination so inhumanly strong that it served him better than any iron forged blade. The lion was no feral berserker, but rather a calculating hunter ruled by logic and not simple rage. When he was discovered at last by the Knights of Caliban, he was judged so dangerous that it might be best to have him slain, treated as one of the great beasts of the forest. It was the judgment of one man that would see him brought into the realm of mankind and away from that of beasts. And that man was named Luther. As a champion among the warriors that had defended Caliban through the long years of old night, Luther named his new charge Lion L. Johnson, which meant the lion, son of the forest, in the Calibanite dialect of Low Gothic, and raised him as a knight of the order. He taught him their laws and strictures to mete out justice as a man rather than as a beast, and gave him something that the young Primarch had never before had, a reason to fight beyond simple survival. Caliban was a dying world its people besieged by the great beasts that thronged in the hidden depths of the forest and slowly driven to extinction. The order which built and manned the great fortresses at the borders of the wild had vainly tried to stem the tide, but had succeeded only at slowing the pace of their people's destruction for they were too few to do more than defend their fastnesses and the constant assaults. L. Johnson was taken to the Order's chief fortress monastery of Alduruk and taught human ways. The lion learned to speak incredibly quickly and soon mastered all of the necessary aspects of Calibanite culture faster than anyone, including Luther, his mentor, foster father and best friend believed possible. Before long, the lion had become a fierce warrior in the Order's ranks. Though of his years living alone in the forests, he said nothing, then or later. With Luther at his side, L. Johnson ultimately rose into the highest ranks of the Order. At the height of his reputation, 
he made clear his extraordinary ambition. He called for a grand crusade to exterminate the great beasts of Caliban so that the people of his world could finally know peace and live free from fear. This was received with great enthusiasm by the other members of the Order and even other knightly orders, but it proved to be a time-consuming process that took nearly a solar decade of constant warfare against the terrible dangers of the deep forests. Al Johnson would quickly prove not only a superlative warrior and strategist, but also a leader whose quiet confidence and iron will drew recruits to the order in numbers never before seen. With each victory against the great beasts of the forest, each fell head planted upon the walls of the order's fortresses, more warriors took up arms with hope in more than simple survival. The lion stood at the forefront of this new crusade, not by choice, for he had ever been taciturn and prone to seek solitude, but by action, always to be found at the fore of any battle and unafraid to speak his mind or act when others might hesitate. By his order, the old traditions that allowed only the nobility to fight among the knightly orders of Caliban were dropped, swelling its ranks further at the cost of some descent within the ranks of the more traditional knights. Any Calibanite knightly order that did not follow his lead, such as the Knights of Lupus of the Northern Forests, which feared, like many, that the destruction of the great beasts would upend Caliban's traditional social order, was destroyed to the last man. Within the space of a solar decade, the Order's ranks had grown to the point that they were able to take the war for their survival ever deeper into the world forest itself. With Lion L. Johnson and Luther at their head, they unleashed their crusade to rid Caliban of its curse, bringing flame and steel to the lair of the monsters that had hunted them for generations beyond count. The war was long and bloody, with hundreds slain for each monstrous nest put to the torch, and many grew weary of the slaughter. All save the grim knight, L. Johnson. The lion knew that mercy had no place in war, to leave with their task unfinished and with any of the foe yet alive would be to waste all of the lives spent in its pursuit. There could be only one end, and that was the total annihilation of the enemy by whatever means was needed. He set the knights to ambush the great beasts as they came to feed, poison the pools at which the creatures drank, and set ablaze vast tracts of the forest to set them to flight. He gave the foe no respite and hunted them till no more could be found, and when his warriors spoke of his prowess and victories, it was fear that colored their words as much as awe. Some of Caliban's aristocracy, following in the wake of the Knights of Lupus, feared his new methods and determination enough to declare open rebellion, some fearing the changes he had wrought upon the tradition-bound people of Caliban, and others simply seeking to claim the power he had come to wield. These traitors to the cause of Caliban's salvation were put down without mercy, the ranks of their knights and soldiers culled in their entirety, and their fastnesses torn down as a warning to others. 
At the end of the crusade against the great beasts, with both the lion and Luther exhausted by the terrible cost the fighting had exacted, it was L. Johnson that received the battle honors and the title of Grand Master of the Order. He accepted the accolade without fanfare, for such human eccentricity still seemed less worthwhile to the youth that had grown to manhood among monsters. He understood little the value some placed upon titles and rewards, for his grim and solitary habits had always kept him distant from others, and he saw not the change his rise had wrought in Luther. For where they had once competed as equals for honor and victory, the Primarch had now eclipsed his mentor and brother, leaving him behind as he grudgingly accepted the people's adulation and offer to rule over all of Caliban. It was a wound dealt in ignorance, for L. Johnson did not see the spark of fierce pride that burned within his brother ignite to jealousy in the face of his triumphs, a wound that would fester in the years to follow. Had the Emperor not arrived shortly after this victory, descending from the heavens to claim his lost son, then perhaps this wound might have healed in Caliban's new peace. But this was not to be. The Emperor came to heap new glories upon the Lion, granting him command of the First Legion, whom he renamed the Dark Angels after an ancient Calibanite myth that spoke to their grim mien, and making him a general within the vast Imperial army that sought to conquer the galaxy. Lion L. Johnson would soon leave for distant Terra and his new destiny, bringing his uncompromising and remorseless style of warfare to the ranks of the Imperial forces. To him would fall the role of Watchman at the edge of the Emperor's domain, the bane of monsters and beasts, and the bearer of weapons too terrible to entrust to any other. He would be the cold and inevitable destroyer, the doom that once unleashed could not be recalled, subverted, or delayed. Taught by the black depths of the forests of Caliban, the value of cold, ruthless tenacity, Lionel Johnson was the first of all the Primarchs, war distilled into its rawest and most fundamental essence, death that walked like a man, and the galaxy would be forever changed by his return. And the angels of darkness descended on pinions of fire and light, the great and terrible dark angels. From an ancient Calibanite fable. Shortly after the success of the campaign against the great beasts in 846 M30, the Emperor of Mankind and a small band of his Legiones Astartes scouts drawn from the First Legion arrived on Caliban after they detected the psychic emanations of one of the Primarchs. From the moment the Emperor first landed, L. Johnson felt the deep connection between himself and the Master of Mankind, and swore his fealty. In return, the Emperor made him the commander of the first legion of space marines that had been created from his genome. The Emperor had launched his great crusade 
after the end of old night, to reunite all the lost colonies of humanity and restore mankind's birthright as the rulers of the galaxy. His space marine legions purged entire star systems of humanity's Xenos oppressors. As the Imperium's wave of conquest advanced across the galaxy, Imperial scouts brought word that they had rediscovered the isolated world of Caliban in the Segmentum Obscurus, and that it was home to a man who was likely one of the missing Primarchs. Only a small honor guard of the First Legion would accompany the Emperor to Caliban, for the Legion was still scattered to war zones across the front lines of the Great Crusade. A mere 500, mostly veterans of the Host of Death, would precede the Master of Mankind as he journeyed to greet his lost son, the Knight of Caliban known as the Lion. Arrayed in the jet black power armor and mortuary symbols that had come to be their mark, it seemed as if the old tales of Calibanite legend and myth had come to life. A host of dark angels mustering before the stronghold of the Order and kneeling before Lion L. Johnson. In that initial fateful encounter, the Legion would earn a new title from the first of the Primarchs, for he saw fit to test the mettle of his new followers by personally dueling the captain of the company. The Lion stood against the Cataphracti armored warrior and matched his Calibanite steel to the power field wreathed blade of his opponent and left him wounded in the dust. The Lion took their measure, and they his, and both learned the respect for the other. From that day forth, the Primarch would call the Astartes of the First Legion his Dark Angels, a title that soon spread throughout the Legion. Within a short span of time, the Emperor arrived at the Order's Fortress Monastery to reclaim his lost Jean's son in person and induct Caliban formally into the Imperium of Man, its vast forests to be cleared for industry and the first types of recruits claimed from among its population to replenish the depleted ranks of the First Legion. The day of his arrival was one that would live on for centuries in Calibanite legend. His great vessel descended from the heavens and he welcomed his lost son back into the Imperial fold. The event was slightly marred by an attempt against the Emperor's life made by certain conservative knights of the Order who feared the changes that would be wrought to their world by the Imperium and its advanced science and culture. But these malcontents were swiftly and mercilessly executed as traitors by the Astartes. The First Legion's governing Council of Masters on distant Grammarai would soon hear of Lion L. Johnson, the man who was their Primarch, and once more they were riven by dissension. Though none would doubt the word of the Emperor that this Knight of Caliban was their true lord, they were split by shame and pride. Some were stricken by remorse at the state of the legion their Primarch would inherit, while others wished to set forth and bring a suitable victory as a trophy to set at the feet of their new master. All across the galaxy, 
the dispersed units of the First Legion reacted much the same, some detachments redoubling their efforts and throwing themselves into combat with renewed zeal to bring honor to the Legion, while others sought to extricate themselves from their campaigns so they might travel to Caliban and ask forgiveness of their returned Primarch. The Lion himself was brought to Tara by the Emperor, that he might learn of the war the Master of Mankind wished him to prosecute, and of the role he would play for the Imperium in the years yet to come. Soon, the Space Marines of the First Legion, who had accompanied the Emperor to Caliban, were putting potential Astartes aspirants from the Order and the other knightly organizations through myriad martial trials and competitions to gauge their level of martial prowess and character. Only the strongest and most dedicated were allowed to pass to the next stage. Many within the Order whispered that they were competing for a place within the ranks of the Astartes, but these trials also served the secondary purpose of determining if the human strain on Caliban was genetically pure enough to warrant its status as a world that the First Legion could recruit from in the coming years. While the Calibanite knightly orders reveled in their differences and often resorted to combat to settle their feuds, the Space Marine Legions were united in purpose and will. Such division could not be tolerated, and at the behest of the Lion and the Dark Angels, the individual knightly orders were disbanded and brought under the control of the First Legion. Such a drastic move did not happen overnight, and could not pass without dissenting voices. But when the Lion spoke in favor of the Union of Knights, and the glory that would be theirs for the taking in the service of the Emperor, most such voices were stilled. Most, but not all. More objections were raised when the soldiers of the Imperial Army descended to the surface of Caliban. The First Legion's aspirant trials had already identified the likely candidates for recruitment into that august body, but the vast majority of the planet's population would still be able to serve the Emperor as troops of the Imperial Army. Within an unimaginable short period of time, the surface of Caliban was transformed from a world of sprawling wilderness and castles to one of martial industry that rang to the beat of factory hammers and the tramp of booted feet as its populace girded itself for interstellar war. The Emperor's servants had descended to Caliban with enormous earth-moving machines that cleared dozens of kilometers of forests a solar day and left flat, lifeless soil in their wake, ready to be planted or built upon. Mines, Refineries and Manufactoria followed, ready to transform the planet's abundant resources into vital war material for the Emperor's crusade. Cities were built to supply the sprawling industrial sites, growing upwards and outwards with each passing Tehran year as the traditional villages and towns surrounding the fortress monasteries were emptied and their citizens relocated to better serve the Imperium. Finally, the day arrived when those individuals whose courage had been proven beyond doubt, whose stamina 
endurance, and strength had seen them through the Astartes trials were ready to be added to the ranks of the First Legion. Word had come from Luther that the Astartes had made their final selection for advanced training and the gene enhancement required to join their ranks. Through the application of imperial science and the marvels of the gene sea, these aspirants were transformed over the next several standard years into Battle Brothers of the First Legion, the newly renamed Dark Angels. Luther had also been chosen to join, but in common with a large proportion of that initial intake from the Order and the other Calibanite Knightly Orders, he had been too old to benefit from the implantation of Gene Seed. In its place, he and others like him had undergone an extensive series of genetic, surgical, and biochemical enhancement procedures designed to increase their strength, stamina, and reflexes to superhuman levels. They were taller, stronger, and quicker than mortal men, but still, they were no true Astartes. It was difficult for Luther and the others to come to terms with that fact, knowing that they were surrounded by those who had once served under them as squires and junior knights, but were now far more powerful than they could ever hope to become. Luther still served as the Lion's second within the Legion, earning his position based on merit and fuel with a desire to prove himself by his devotion to the Imperial ideal. But despite his successes, he could not escape his own inner conviction that he was somehow being looked down upon because he was not a full Astartes. As for Lion L. Johnson, his brother Primarchs would come to call him dour and morose, given to dark moods and heedless of the counsel of others. But he saw things simply and starkly. He learned on Tala that the war he had fought in Caliban's monster-haunted forests had not been ended, but only begun for the galaxy teemed with monsters to be slain. He dedicated himself to one task, killing. He had no time for sanguineous chivalric ideals, for Mortarion's arbitrary hatreds or Fulgrim's obsession with beauty. Such passion only obfuscated the true goal that the enemies of mankind should be destroyed. As the first of all the Primarchs created by the Emperor, he was both more and less than his brothers, a primal force of destruction whose single-minded focus wrought him more inhuman than even Magnus the Red. The Lion could stand against any of his kin, match blades with Fulgrim, and stalemate the strategies of Robut Giaman, and though some might exceed him in the details of some tasks, there were none that were his equal in the grander scope of battle, none whose will could match the bloody-minded determination of the lion. His talons and resolute confidence, which some might have called arrogance, won him few friends, but saw him placed at the head of his legion faster than any of the Primarchs to be rediscovered before him. And the legion he inherited was in sore need of its Primarch and in need of a new beginning. Scattered and fractured, the First Legion remained a powerful fighting force, 
but one whose purpose had become lost in the long years of the Great Crusade. Before the coming of the Primarch, they had been mentors and guides for the younger legions, but their students had long since found their own wisdom. Now, Lionel Johnson would grant them a new purpose, one in keeping with the Primarch's own methods and the vision he had for the Emperor's Great Crusade. His first acts were to merge many of the teachings of Caliban's techno-feudal aristocracy with those of the First Legion's Hexagrammaton. Fusing the best of Tala and Caliban to create something new and more refined, and to gather the scattered fragments of his legion together. With the first generations of recruits taken from the ranks of the worthy among the Knights of Caliban still undergoing implantation of the gene seed, hypnogogic indoctrination, and live fire training, the lion prepared to embark on a crusade of his own. With him were to be found the original 500 warriors that had first arrived at Caliban, as well as those chapters and battle groups that had sought him out to pledge their allegiance, as well as auxiliar companies raised from the stock of Caliban to serve the Imperial Army and a small retinue of Mechanicum Magi from the Forge world of Xana too, eager to court favor with the new Primarch. In full, they numbered 20,000 warriors, perhaps a third of the Legion, each marked by the new beginning they were pledged to, adorned with the winged sword of Lion L. Johnson's dark angels instead of the grim marks of an age now ended. The Lion led this host for seeking out those companies of his Jean sons that had not yet found their way to his side, to find those scattered warriors amid the chaos of the Great Crusade, a war waged across a galaxy by ten billion warriors under arms, was no small feat and made possible only by the genius of the Lion himself and the art of the tech adepts of Xana who quickly passed the data banks of the Divisio Militaris to discern in which campaigns the First Legion bled and died. For any other Legion, the arrival of their newly rediscovered Primarch might have been the cause for raucous celebration or ostentatious parade, but not so for the Grim First. News of Lionel Johnson's approach most often spurred the warriors of the First Legion to redouble their efforts in battle, throwing themselves upon the foe without care for their survival so that when they stood before their gene father, they might offer him the blood-soaked laurels of victory. Each battle-worn company received their new master with the same stoic reserve, with silent curtsy and brief but solemn vows of allegiance, and each was tested in battle by the Primarch himself before they joined the ranks of his growing entourage. As was the way of the lion, he demonstrated his worth by his actions and skill, rather than with words and vague promises, allowing those who might doubt him to match their blades against his in honest combat. None among the Legion could question his right to lead after such a trial, though some few harbored misgivings at the sudden changes he brought to the centuries-old doctrines of the Legion and the shift in authority he represented. Within a few short standard years, the Lion had gathered the vast majority of his Legion together, 
near a hundred thousand warriors and led them to the ancient stronghold on Gramarai. There, the gathered council of masters and preceptors conclave awaited him amid the many glories of the First Legion's long and glorious history and the amassed wisdom distilled from its battles. Here, surrounded by the dusty trophies of the past, Lionel Johnson made his Legion whole once again. He faced the ceremonial champion of the Council of Masters in the Ring of Honor, battling Pyrus Kalagad, the master of the Host of Fire, in an hour-long duel that has since become legend. This final trial ended. The Primarch accepted the titles of Grand Master of the First Legion, the Six Wings of the Hexagrammaton, and High Preceptor of the Orders Militant of the First Legion, the first warrior to consolidate the leadership of the entire Legion under one banner. To the gathered warriors of the Dark Angels, whose oaths had now been sworn in blood and sacrifice, the new Primarch swore an oath of his own, an oath to seal the pact between them. This oath is recorded in the books of the Council of Masters. We are the Angels of Darkness. For us, there is no peace, no end but war and death. We shall not walk in the golden halls of mankind's future, but stand resolute in the shadows beyond. While we yet draw breath, this Imperium will not fall, and we will not know defeat, for I pledge every warrior every drop of blood in the Legion in the name of victory, no matter the cost. The Reorganization of the First Legion with his oath to his legion sworn, Lion L. Johnson saw the rise of his dark angels, placing new masters over each of the wings he had created from the bones of the legion's old hosts and formalizing its various informal orders in the style of Caliban's knightly orders. With the first influx of new recruits from Caliban now ready to join the Legion, comprising those older warriors like Luther that had opted to undergo the painful and unreliable cybernetic and genetic augmentic enhancement process that allowed them to reach levels of ability comparable to true space marines, Lionel Johnson swiftly incorporated them within this new structure, taking care to assign posts and commands based only on merit and not due to origin or the simple virtue of time in service. A number of the Lion's old companions from the Order found positions within his inner circle and despite the stringent trials he insisted upon, some of them were less than pleased to yield their authority to these comparative newcomers. The old Grand Legion Chantry on Grammarai was torn down, replaced with a more modest fortress to secure the industrial sprawl of that world, Although the Legion would maintain a great fortress monastery on Caliban, its true heart and seat of power would be the sanctum of its Primarch aboard his flagship, the ancient Gloriana class battleship Invincible Reason. For many, this reinvigoration of the Legion served to dispel the malaise that had long lain over the first, discarding the vain glory that had sapped the worth from victory and embracing the purity of the Primarch's vision. Though for a silent minority of veterans, 
the sudden and jarring dissolution of old traditions and the introduction of new Calibanite blood left a lingering sense of doubt. The lion chose to confront any intransigence with the stoic indifference that was his hallmark, choosing to immerse the legion in war and trust that his example would dispel any doubt. Dispersed under the masters and knight commands of the legion, he set the dark angels to their task, while the primarch led his own fleet to answer a call for aid received only recently by the newly installed astropathic quad Caliban. His destination was the distant world of Carcassonne where the Ultramarines garrison there had resisted siege for over eight solar months after a sudden uprising against imperial rule among the population living within the ruined halls of the shattered world fortress. The desperate rebels had opened hidden vaults deep beneath the surface of the planet and set loose a biogenic phage that had reshaped the broken people of their world into twisted, blood-hungry ghouls whose minds were burned clean of all thought except the need to hunt and kill. These monstrous mutant creations then fell upon the unsuspecting warriors of the 13th Legion with a ferocity that gave pause to even the warriors of the Legiones Astartes. With much of the Great Crusade's strength concentrated to the Galactic East, there were few forces available to relieve the beleaguered Ultramarines and, given the history of Kagasam, few expected the Dark Angels to return. So, when the Invincible Reason broke through the Immaterium and entered real space, its drop bays already open and primed for launch, Praetor Arteon of the 13th, the commander of the all but over on Astartes garrison, lost for a moment the famous stoic reserve of the Ultramarines and cried out for joy at the sight. The lion himself was at the forefront of the relief force, cutting a path through the teeming hordes of flesh ghouls that threatened to overrun the Ultramarines. At the head of a thousand ebon-armored veterans of the Dread Wing, the new master of the First Legion made swift work of the foe. A curtain of superheated plasma scouring clean the walls and bunkers of the Ultramarine's fortress. At his heels came the full force of the fleet, ten thousand transhuman warriors of the Dark Angels, and by their blades was the enemy put to rout and then annihilated as they cowered in their bolt holes. When the Ultramarines sallied forth from their fortifications to meet them among the sea of corpses and ash, they did so with some trepidation, perhaps expecting some measure of retribution for the last meeting between their legions at Kargasam, or a demand to cede the world to the First Legion in return for their aid. Yet the lion had no interest in old grudges or the tawdry business of accolades and honors, and with the killing complete, he left without fanfare, leaving behind only an empty banner to mark the Dark Angel's debt to the Ultramarines paid. That this was among his first battles was no accident but a statement of his intent. He was not to play at politics, not to build empires, nor monuments. He was pledged to war and death, to kill the enemies of the Emperor and nothing else. And so it was 
with this doctrine in mind that Lion L. Johnson and his Dark Angels took up their duties in the latter days of the Great Crusade. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or lose our ventures. From the Emperor of Mankind. Twenty legions of space marines were created by the Emperor during the Great Crusade to join and lead his quest to unite all of humanity under the aegis of the Imperium of Man. The nascent Proto-Legion known as the Primus or First Legion, later renamed after a series of cognomens including the First, the Angels of Death, and the Uncrowned Princes as the Angelis Tenebraium, or Dark Angels, was the very first of those original, first founding legions to be created at the beginning of the Great Crusade. The First Legion was raised first to active service in a staged process of testing and trials before the full active force was created through mass recruitment. Each stage of creation resulted in an expansion of the gene seed implantation on progressively larger groups of neophytes. During the Unification Wars on Tala, they were the first of the Space Marine Legions to be created and were therefore originally under the command of the Emperor himself. Once he discovered Lionel Johnson on Caliban, however, the Primarch took command of the Dark Angels that had been created from his genetic stock, and he was granted command of the 4th Expeditionary Fleet of the Great Crusade. The Compliance of Molech One of Lion L. Johnson's earliest campaigns as commander of the newly dubbed Dark Angels Legion was the Imperial Compliance of the newly discovered Night World of Molech. This was a massive, joint compliance operation between multiple Legiones Astartes, including the Dark Angels, Lunar Wolves, Emperor's Children, White Scars, and thousands of Imperialis Auxilia soldiers and various Mechanicum and Legio Titanicus assets. Cyprian Devine of House Devine was named Planetary Governor of Molech. In the presence of several of his Primarch sons, the Emperor led them to a warp gate hidden underground, where he proceeded to utilize it to enter into the Realm of Chaos to parley with the Ruiner's powers. When he finally returned, he appeared aged but much more powerful. He then psychically suppressed his son's memories of Molech and stationed a large garrison force comprised of nearly a hundred Imperialis Auxilia regiments, three Legio Titanicus cohorts, along with detachments from two Space Marine legions to protect the secrets of the Warp Gate. The second and third Rangdan Xenocides. Next, the Dark Angels took part in the vital campaigns of the final Rangdan Xenocides. 
They fought alongside titans from the Legio Griffonicus, Legio Vulturum, and Legio Cidianos, as well as other Xanite Mechanicum forces from the Forge world of Xana II. The conflict began in 862 M30, when the Rangda, that Xenos terror long thought extinguished in the earlier first Rangdan Xenocide, fell upon the northern reaches of the Imperium in numbers that defied belief. For almost a solar decade, the veterans of the First Legion, now the Dark Angels, fought to hold at bay an enemy that threatened to consume all the worlds of mankind. The Lion wrought his own legend in those dark times, a grim figure of death and vengeance that descended upon the Rangda in a cold fury. In the first dire standard years of the conflict, when the Imperium seemed lost in a tide of Xenos fiends and their slaves, the Lion stood tall amid the carnage. He was no golden hero like his brother Sanguinius, nor a black-humored figurehead like Horus Lupercal, but rather a silent rock, unyielding in the storm. He did not inspire loyalty, nor any other virtue. Rather, he went forth where the foe was strongest, armored by his pride and confidence, and drew others along with him for the simple honor of standing by his side. For nearly a solar decade, the battles would rage, some nine Space Marine Legions taking part in the fighting, and ravaging human colonies across the northern sectors of the Imperium. Of those legions caught up in the fighting, many would suffer serious losses. The Space Wolves making the loss of some 5,000 Astartes, breaking the siege of Xana alone, and the Dark Angels gathered once again in almost their full number, bore a toll of their own. The Angels hurled themselves at their enemies and broke their greater strength in countless battles against the vile Xenos on the edge of the Halo Stars. This campaign culminated in the third Rangdan Xenocide around 890 M30, which resulted in the loss of the lives of 50,000 Dark Angel Space Marines spent in preventing the destruction of perhaps the entire Northern Imperium by the alien menace from the Outer Darkness. At the breaking of the Great Citadel of Vorksag, during the vast clash of void ships over Morkar and the seven solar week long Battle of Moreau, where three companies of the Dark Angels held against more than a million Rang Dang Neuro Shackled Servitors, victory was bought at the cost of their lives, and the blood of the old Legion. For when victory was at last proclaimed, and the Rang Dang menace vanquished for the final time, the Dark Angels were but a tenth of their old number. Some say the old legion fought to prove themselves worthy of their new master. Others, they bled to make right their failure to destroy the Rangda when first they met at the Battle of Advex Moors. And a few whispered that the lion sent them into slaughter so he might replace them with more tractable Calibanite warriors. Whether true or not, it was to Caliban that the Lion turned to replenish the ranks of his legion. With the Rangdan plague driven back, the first new influx of true Calibanite space marines entered the ranks of the legion, 
where once they had been but the few older companions of the Primarch. Now they were dispersed across all the wings and orders of the Legion. They were a new breed of warrior for the First Legion, guided more by tradition and ritual than their forebears, and unburdened by the weight of pride that had been the lodestone of the Tehran veterans. In the wake of the Second Rangdan Xenocide, it was this changed Legion that went forth to continue its works and to bring war to the most fell of foes. From Caliban, they spread out across the stars, for unlike many of their brethren, they took few strongholds, save for the lonely chantry holes that held the knowledge of the Legion. Each of their expeditionary fleets was bound to a different corner of the Imperium, to patrol the dark places where monsters were still to be found. The Lion took command of one such fleet, no larger or more grand than any other, for he expected each to be an engine of death capable of defeating any foe, and set course for the world known to Imperial cartographers as Sarosh. Due to the extensive losses suffered by the First Legion during the Rangdan Xenocides by 899 M30, the Ultramarines Legion were on the cusp of becoming the largest Space Marine Legion, standing at around 166,000 Legionaries. The Feud of Dulan as the Space Marine Legions pushed back the frontiers of the Imperium, each Primarch strove to excel in the eyes of the Emperor, and none more so than Lehman Russ, Primarch of the Space Wolves. Only Horace Lupercal and Lion L. Johnson could claim more victories than him, and this was a constant frustration. It was on the world of Delan in 870 M30, where the Space Wolves were fighting alongside the Dark Angels, that matters came to a head. This incident would start the millennia-long rivalry between the Dark Angels and the Space Wolves. The planetary governor of Delan, Durad, had denounced the Space Wolf Primarch Lehman Russ as the Emperor's lapdog and swore to feed his heart to his pet, Grox. Russ, enraged, swore to kill Dorath himself and demanded the satisfaction of leading the assault. Johnson, however, had meticulously planned the attack and was not about to let his brother's hot-headedness foil his plans. Johnson led the assault, leaving Russ to watch helplessly as he killed Durath. After the battle, Russ stormed into the fortress and struck Johnson across the room. A brawl ensued that lasted a full solar day and night the two combatants being said to be equally matched. While Russ was slightly stronger, the lion was slightly quicker. Russ eventually ceased and started laughing, realizing how foolish their fight was and how he had allowed his pride and temper to get the better of him. Johnson, however, still angry at what he considered the Treachery of Russ's first punch knocked the laughing Space Wolf out cold with one final blow. By the time Russ regained consciousness, the Dark Angels had departed for new fields of battle in the Great Crusade. It has since been customary for selected champions from both chapters to engage in a non-lethal duel whenever they meet, so that honor may be satisfied. 
The Battle of Dulan and the infamous feud between the Dark Angels and the Space Wolves is a tale told many times. In essence, it is always recounted as a simple tale, yet one that has seen a number of tellings, each of which has had its own agenda, and rarely has that agenda been the simple truth. Lehman Ross and Lionel Johnson were both assigned to the conquest of the world of Dulan, and while the Space Wolves waited and lay siege, the Dark Angels staged a sudden assault that allowed them to claim the honor of the final victory. On hearing of this, it is most often claimed that Lehman Ross flew into a rage and assaulted his brother leading to the legendary duel between them that their legion's successor chapters are rumored to reenact whenever they meet. This has led to the popular assumption of a bitter grudge between the Space Wolves and the Dark Angels, a sense of lasting ill will brought about by this single isolated incident that has been accepted by history as fact. Yet, those two legions and their later successor chapter fought together on a number of occasions, both before and after the Battle of Dulan. Without rancor and in many cases with a noted sense of shared camaraderie, indeed, it has often been noted that the two Primarchs, Lion, L. Johnson and Lehman Russ, were of much the same character though they oft expressed it differently. Both were practical to their core, with little time for frivolity or the excesses of civilization. Both valued plain speaking over political necessity, and judged men and women by the actions they took rather than the words they spoke. But above all, the two Primarchs placed the utmost value on loyalty, holding their oaths as iron bonds and reserving the deepest hate for those who would forsake a vow. This being true, it throws the events on Dulan and the grudge they are supposed to have given birth to into a strange light. That the two fought is not in doubt for too many sources agree on it, that either came to hold a grudge is implausible. If anything, the record of the two Primarchs suggests a deep bond of trust and mutual respect. Together they had seen the end of the Rangdan Empire, had conquered a thousand worlds and vanquished some of the most terrible foes to stand against the Imperium. Dulan would seem to have represented one of many tests, a test that allowed the two to take a measure of each other, and the test oft repeated when they or their warriors met, but one repeated without the rancor often attributed to it. There exists no greater symbol of the loyalty held between the two legions, the Wolves of Fenris and the Knights of Caliban, than in the final days of the rebellion against the Emperor, when Horus himself trembled as the two legions reunited as brothers in arms, ready to test themselves against the forces that lay siege to Tara. The Subjugation of Saraj The Dark Angels' fourth expeditionary fleet under the command of Lionel Johnson took part in the continued compliance of Saraj, officially codified as Sigma 517, but known to the Dark Angels as 43, the third world brought to compliance by the fourth expeditionary fleet which had formerly been commanded by an officer of the White Scars Legion. Lionel Johnson went in answer to a call for aid from his brother Jagatai Khan. Of all the Primarchs, the Khan stood closest to the Lion, for despite their differences, each appreciated the honest and forthright nature of the other, 
and so the lion was ill disposed to ignore his call. The Sorosi, ruled by a planetary bureaucracy, had recently expressed their interest in becoming part of the Imperium, and the Imperials were eager to allow them in, believing that these people seemed to possess the same secular beliefs as they did in the Imperial truth. But over a standard year had passed and the Sarosi were as yet no closer to attaining compliance, constantly apologizing to the Imperial planetary governor chosen for their world, Harlad first, that their bureaucracy was slowing the process. But the Sarosi, without mentioning it to the Imperial expedition, secretly worshipped chaos entities in the warp they called the Melachim, and saw the anti-religious stance of the pre-heresy Imperium's imperial truth as unsuppressed evil. After the Dark Angel's fleet arrived in orbit to accelerate the compliance process, the Lord High Exactor, the leader of the Sorosi bureaucracy, who had been invited aboard the Invincible Reason to meet the Primarch, denounced L. Johnson and the Emperor to the Primarch's face aboard their flagship, and L. Johnson responded by ramming his power sword through the fanatical Sarosi leader's body. But the Sarosi delegation, had also brought a hidden nucleonic device aboard their shuttle, intending to assassinate the fleet's entire command structure, including L. Johnson, in one fell swoop. However, Luther and a junior librarian named Zahariel El Zurias managed to eject the shuttle into space, causing only minor damage to the flagship. Luther admitted to Zahariel that he had discovered the device earlier and had briefly considered allowing it to kill his oldest friend, largely because of the jealousy that had begun to grow in his soul. The rebels on Sarosh would be crushed for their treachery, brought to heel swiftly by the might of the Dark Angels and the Imperium's armies. But the victory would leave a bitter taste for many. In the aftermath of the fighting, some questioned the ease with which the Sarosi had infiltrated the First Legion's defenses and thought none would call what had occurred treachery. There were those whose devotion to the Legion's new path was questioned. Luther, Zahariel, and five hundred of the angels drawn from among the veterans of both Terra and Caliban were to find themselves returned to Caliban, not in exile, but neither in triumph. There, they were to serve as a garrison force, the overseers of the Lion's Sanctuary, and to continue the recruitment of new space marines into the Legion from the Calibanite population. They were required to leave the Great Crusade behind, regardless of their legacy of standard years in service in either the Calibanite forest or among the stars. This was the determination of the Lion, that he would set aside even those whom he held dearest in the name of duty. Some would name it arrogance, and others, with the benefit of hindsight, would call it foolhardy. It wasn't the cold logic of battle favored by some among the Primarchs, but the proud imperative of duty and excellence that those who faltered be set aside, no matter how justified or small the failing, and the worthy grow stronger through the trials they faced. The Final Days of the Crusade By this creed of strength and excellence, the First Legion, the Dark Angels, 
lived and died, continuing the work of the Emperor in the last days of the Great Crusade. Wherever the tide of Imperial conquest slowed, they were to be found, bright swords and grim resolve against the worst horrors of the galaxy. Lionel Johnson, now long parted from the forests of Caliban and a staunch believer in the dream of human empire embodied in his gene father, fought with every moment given to him. He spent no time on parades, fortress building or in petty squabbles with his kin, but went stoically from battle to battle. He and his legion began to shun the gatherings of the Great Crusade and the fellowship of their brothers among the Legiones Astartes, scorning those who would fret over such frivolities while there remained enemies of power and strength to test their mettle against. As the years and wars wore on, a distance grew between the Dark Angels and the other legions of the Imperium. Few of the Primarchs cared to take the time to seek out their reclusive brother as he and his legion continued to wet their blades to a keen edge. They began to forget the deeds he and his warriors had performed, for he rarely spoke of them, all except one. Horus Lupercal, ever watchful paid much heed to his brother and the actions of his legion. Once he had tried to bind them to him, only to find the cipher of their ways a shield against his influence and their pride a foil to his manipulation. His and Lorgar's warrior lodges would find no purchase within the ranks of the Dark Angels, as they were shunned by the preceptors of the Orders Militant and the proctors of the wings of the Hexagrammaton as worthless and beneath them. The Dark Angels were not and never could be Horuses to command. The Dark Angels master was as his legion, a rock in which Horus could find no crack or chink in which to fix his barbs, no psychological leash by which he could lead him along paths of his own choosing. The Lion was not well liked among the Brotherhood of the Primarchs, but he had the respect of each and every one of them, and more than that, he had the trust of his father, the Emperor and the keys to the hidden and ancient arsenals of terror. Were the Emperor to choose a single one among his Primarchs to lead, to stand at the head of the Great Crusade, then Lion L. Johnson was a choice easily understood, and this troubled the Master of the Lunar Wolves. So. When the conquest of Ulanor Prime loomed before him in M30, he was sure to see the Lion and the First Legion diverted to far battlefields and tendered him no invitation to the great triumph of Ulanor that followed. So it was that when Horus was crowned as the War Master of the Imperium, the Lion was not present. A victory to the covetous mind of the new War Master. Yet, this was one of the few miscalculations made by the shrewd intellect of the War Master. He counted all men of power to think as he did. Yet, while the Lion and the Wolf of Luna shared many traits, they were not the same. When news of Horus's new rank reached Lionel Johnson, he did not pause in his campaigns, nor did he offer congratulations or lament his own fortune, and this, more than the reaction of any of his other brother Primarchs, gave the War Master pause. When Horus's thoughts later turned to rebellion and treachery, 
After his fall to chaos in the Temple of the Serpent Lodge on Davin, it is likely that it was the lion he marked as among the greatest of threats to his plans. The Dark Angels were both numerous and skilled in all the arts of war, with access to the armories of Terra and Psy Arcana forbidden to all others, and their Primarch was as inflexible as iron, loyal beyond doubt to the Emperor and resolute enough to rise up against any threat to his father's grand dream of human unity. As with all of the Primarchs, the Warmaster did not feel fear as did lesser mortals, but the thought of facing Lion L. Johnson in open battle at least gave him pause, and if he would not be turned to the traitor's cause, then he must be removed. There were three Space Marine Legions Horus sought to remove from the path of his heresy before it began. The white scars he hoped to preserve for his own use, the blood angels he hoped to destroy or corrupt, but the dark angels he hoped to banish, to send far enough away that by the time they could return, his grim business would be complete. This was not to be, for the lion would return to the Imperium as the sun returns to the horizon each morning, blinding and implacable, and he would reach for the heart of his fallen brother. Horus had loosed a beast, the equal of any that lurked in the world straddling forests of Caliban or the silent dark between the stars, one that would tear apart the Imperium if only to grasp a victory of ashes and blood. Unyielded technologically capable, ruthless, and insular. The Dark Angels at the time of the Horus Heresy would once again be a powerful and highly independent legion, used to operating on their own to conduct large-scale campaigns and compliance actions. Because of this, the fear of the First Legion's intervention led the machinations of the Warmaster Horus to ensure that when his treacherous plans came to fruition, the Dark Angels had been dispatched to the outer edges of the Imperium where they would be unable to interfere, at least for a time. As the Horus Heresy progressed, however, the power of this legion would make itself known, savaging the Night Lords of Thramas and going on to unleash destruction on an unprecedented scale during the later years of the Heresy when they crushed traitor world after traitor world across the southern galactic zone. The Suppression of the Gordian League During the 200th year of the Great Crusade, 998M30, the Dark Angels Legion was carrying out an Imperial Compliance campaign against the shield world of the so-called Gordian League, a confederation of human worlds who were allied with Degenerate Xenos. During the Seven Terran year long campaign in 05 M31, the Dark Angel's High Command received word that the War Master Horus and his 16th Legion had renounced their oaths of allegiance to the Emperor, along with the Primarch Angren's World Eaters, Mortarian's Death Guard, and Fulgrim's Emperor's Children. They also received word of the atrocity committed against the doomed world of Istvan III, 
when Horus ordered it to be virus bombed to eliminate the remaining loyalist studies from those four traitor legions still active upon it, rendering it a lifeless dead world. The War Master knew that the Emperor would respond with all the force he had available. Johnson believed that the Dark Angel's deployment to the Shield Worlds on Horus's orders was part of an effort to scatter the Imperium's most loyal servants as far as possible in order to minimize the number of legions he would have to face at any given time. Even so, the strike force of seven full Space Marine legions ordered to the Istvan system in response to the Warmaster's treachery posed a dire threat to his survival. As they made their way towards his forward operating base on the world of Istvan V. The Battle of Diamat. L. Johnson's forces were too deeply enmeshed in the shield worlds of the Gordian League to respond quickly to Horus's betrayal. The best estimates of the Primarch staff indicated that it would take them nearly eight solar months to conclude their offensive operations, even on an emergency basis, and reposition themselves for a strike against Istvan V. Even if they could move more quickly, Horus's agents would be able to alert him in time to organize a counter-strike. However, Johnson believed that a small hand-picked force might accomplish what an entire legion could not. He issued orders for many of the Dark Angels reserve squadrons to resupply and prepare for immediate deployment to the Tanagra system. Their primary target was to secure the forge world of Diamat. They could not afford to let the War Master acquire the substantial supplies and ordnance needed to fortify the world of Istvan V against the approaching Loyalist Strike Force. Al Johnson would personally lead the expedition to Diamat with a battle group of 15 warships. Secrecy was vital, as the Primarch was aware that the War Master's agents were more than likely tracking their movements. He went to Diamat in order to secure several powerful continental siege machines known as Ordinati, vast artillery pieces that could devastate the most powerful fortifications. The small fleet of Dark Angels vessels arrived in the Tanagra system just five solar days after the destruction of Horus's landing force at the Xanthus starport. With no way to secure the siege machines held in storage in Diamant's depots from L. Johnson's Astartes, the Admiral of the raiding fleet had little choice but to withdraw back to the Istvan system. The War Master's final gambit had failed. Following this small victory at the Battle of Diamat, L. Johnson met with his fellow brother Primarch Perturabo of the Iron Warriors Legion aboard his flagship, the Invincible Reason. Perturabo informed him that the 4th Legion was en route to the Istvan system to face the War Master and his traitor legions upon the black sands of Istvan V. Pharos Manus and the Iron Hands Legion had hastened ahead of them, hungry to claim the Emperor's vengeance against Horus. Perturabo lied to El Johnson explaining that he had hoped that his legion could provision his vessels at the Xanthus starport above Diamat before continuing to the combat zone. Of course, they were now unable to, as the first legion had destroyed the orbital port. Perturabo inquired of L. Johnson 
how he had learned of the existence of the Ordinati siege engines. Johnson explained that he had discovered them 50 Tehran years earlier when he was studying the history of the Great Crusade and saw a reference to them in a dispatch from Horus that had been sent to the Emperor. Horus had commissioned the colossal siege machines from the masters of Diamat during the long siege of the Xenos fortress states on Tethonus. The war machines took much longer for the forge masters to complete than planned. By the time they were finished, the campaign on Tethonus had been over for a stunned year and a half, and Horus had moved on to other conquests. So, the weapons were put into a depot on Diamat for the day when the Warmaster would come to claim them. But then, the Eastvan III atrocity occurred. When Johnson had received word of Horace's perfidy, he knew that ultimately the Warmaster's path would lead to Terra. Even if he were somehow to prevail against Perturabo and the other legions sent to confront him in the Eastvan system, the Warmaster couldn't claim total victory so long as the Emperor was safe in his palace. For Horus to triumph, the Emperor had to die, and that meant a long and costly siege of Terra. Therefore, the Warmaster would come to claim the siege engines of Diamat. L. Johnson informed his brother that he would be unable to accompany the Loyalist fleet to Diamat, as he had to make all haste to the shield world of the Gordian League and prepare the rest of the First Legion for the trip to Terra. In fact, he thought it best if no one outside Perturabo himself and the other Primarchs ever knew that he was there. He didn't want the Emperor to believe he did anything at Diamat with an ulterior motive in mind. Perturabo agreed that it was both a prudent choice and a very humble one. L. Johnson explained that his actions were done for the good of the Imperium not for accolades, nor for power. But he also confessed a certain jealousy. He believed Horus had become the Emperor's favorite son for no other reason than fate. Had he been the first of the Primarchs to be found, L. Johnson believed he would have been the War Master instead. The Lion also believed that Horus would inevitably be defeated, and that the Emperor would need to choose a new War Master very quickly if the Great Crusade was to continue. He asked for Perturabo's support. The two Primarchs ultimately reached an understanding. L. Johnson granted permission for the Iron Warriors to take possession of the siege engines at their convenience, on one condition. He made his brother promise that the Ordinati would be put to good use. Perturabo assured his brother that they would be, never letting on that he had already sworn himself to Horus's rebellion and would participate only solar months later at the Drop Sight Massacre on East Van 5, where three Loyalist Legions were almost completely destroyed. The Thramas Crusade Following the victory of the Drop Sight Massacre, Horus called a meeting of the Primarchs of eight of the Traitor Legions, minus the participation of the Alpha Legion's Primarch, Alpharius, aboard his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit. Five of the Primarchs, including four who had fought at Istvan V, met in person, including Horus, Fulgrim, Angren, Mortarion, and Lorgar. 
Three appeared through the use of hololithic emitters that transmitted their signals through the warp, including Perturabo, Conrad Kurz, and Magnus the Red, who had only recently joined the traitors after the scouring of Prospero when the broken remains of his 15th legion had been transported by Zinch into the Eye of Terror to the planet of the Sorcerers. The Thousand Sons, bitter at what they perceive as their betrayal by the Emperor, now willingly became the Ninth Traitor Legion. The Council of Traitor Primarchs made their plans for the next step in their war against the Emperor, and then each legion went its way according to its assigned role. In 07M31, Conrad Kurz's fleet departed, bound for the planet of Tsagualsa, a remote world in the eastern fringe that lay shrouded in the shadow of a great asteroid belt. From there, the Night Lord's Legion's terror troops would begin a campaign of genocide against the Imperial strongholds of Heroldar and Thramas, star systems that, if not taken, would leave the flanks of the Warmaster Strike on Terra vulnerable to attack. This campaign would also delay the Dark Angels Legion from reinforcing the Loyalists. The Thramas system was of particular importance, as it comprised a number of Mechanicum Forge worlds whose loyalty was still to the Emperor. This bitterly contested campaign, known as the Thramas Crusade, dragged on for nearly three standard years. In an attempt to sway his brother, Lionel Johnson, to Horace's cause, the Night Haunter left a deep void beacon in the patrol path of one of the Dark Angel's outrider vessels. The beacon was set to transmit coordinates in advance, so that the two Primarchs could meet and parlay on the planet of Tsagualsa. Night Haunter wanted to break his former brother, either mentally, physically, or both, to obtain his objectives. The Primarchs were accompanied by two warriors from their personal honor guards to the parlay. The meeting began amicably enough between the two as they conversed with relative civility. The amity lasted only until the Night Haunter slandered L. Johnson, and in return, the Lion struck his former brother. This melee further degenerated into an all-out brawl between the two sides, as Kurz strangled the life out of L. Johnson, one of the Dark Angels on our guardsmen ran his sword through the Night Haunter's back, saving his Primarch's life. Eventually, both legions sent reinforcements in response to this incident. Each side dragged away their respective Primarchs from the scene of the combat. Both of them survived this brutal confrontation and went on to continue the contest between their legions for control of the Aegis subsector. The Battle of Perditus in 08 M31, the Dark Angels received intelligence from an astropathic message from the nearby Perditus system about traitor movements. They immediately moved to intercept. Upon arrival, they interrupted the month-long conflict between the Iron Hand's 98th Clan Company led by Casalir Loramek and the large Death Guard contingent led by First Captain Callas Typhon. Both sides have been fighting over an ancient sentient device known as the Tuchalcha Engine. 
This device was part of a triumvirate of similar sentient devices, another being the Ouroboros and the third unnamed engine, which when combined could create temporal rifts that bridge space and time. On its own, the Tuchulcha was capable of precise and extremely efficient warp jumps. Faced with the prospect of fighting the entirety of the much larger First Legion fleet, both sides retreated from the planet's surface at the Lion's request. Wary of both sides' motives, especially those of the Death Guard's first captain, Callus Typhon, the Lion prevented the device from falling into the Death Guard's hands. He proceeded to serve his own ambitions and requisition the device for his own use. He then ordered the destruction of Perditus, much to the consternation of both commanders. He used the Chulcha engine to make a warp jump, but during their sojourn through the Materium, the Dark Angels were beset by demons. The Lion reinstituted his Legion's Librarian Corps to fight these nefarious warp spawn creatures. As this was in direct violation of the Emperor's Decree Absolute at the Council of Nicaea, this caused a dispute within the Legion that eventually came to a head when the enraged Lion slew Chaplain Nemiel. During the height of the Battle of Perditus, the Lion encountered the greater demon of Zinj, known as Kairos, Fate Weaver, who attempted to convert the Primarch to the cause of the Ruiner's powers, but failed miserably as he had nothing to sway the Lion to their cause. He told the foul creature that absolute loyalty to the Emperor was reward enough, and impale the Lord of Change through its black heart. At the same time, he mockingly asked the demon if he had foreseen his defeat. Hunting the Night Haunter Utilizing the Tuchulcha engine a second time, the Dark Angels were able to execute a meticulously planned ambush on the Night Lord's fleet while it was in transit across the Tsagualsa sub-sector that saw the back of the Night Lord's legion broken and their Primarch mortally wounded after having faced his brother L. Johnson once again in mortal combat. Thanks to the skilled coordination and superb execution of the Lion, the Night Lord's fleet was devastated, losing dozens of capital ships and approximately one quarter of their Legion fleet to the Dark Angel's assault. Unfortunately, the remainder of the Night Lord's fleet fled the Angel's wrath taking their critically wounded Primarch with them before the Lion could finally end his wretched life. Later, after a period of recovery, Cruz, his first captain Savatar, and the elite Night Lords Atramenta Terminators led a desperate boarding assault action upon the Dark Angel's flagship, Invincible Reason. This resulted in the death of all but a dozen of the Atramenta and the capture of Savatar and the remaining survivors. Conrad Kurz fled L. Johnson's wrath, invading the Angels for solar months, stalking the shadows within the bowels of their flagship, and continued to wreak terror and chaos amongst the mortal crew. The Night Lord's Primarch also killed every hunter-killer team sent by the Lion to hunt him down. 
After losing several squads of Dark Angels, the Lion himself took up the hunt for Kurz, stalking him throughout the Invincible Reason for the next 16 solar weeks. However, he could never find his elusive brother Primarch. At some point, the remaining Night Lord's captives somehow managed to effect their escape and fled into the void. Imperium Secundus With the torrential ruin storm raging, blocking out the light of the Astronomicon and causing warp travel to be all but impossible, the Imperium was effectively cut in half during much of the Horus Heresy following the Battle of Kalv. The Dark Angels came to the realization that they were unable to return to Terra to assist in its defense, even with the use of the Tuchulcha engine. Miraculously, they did manage to lock onto the beacon of the strange alien device known as the Pharos on the world of Sotha, which guided them safely through the warp and to the realm of Ultramar's capital world of Macridge. There, they were greeted by Robut Giaman and Sanguinius, whose Blood Angel's Legion was also guided to the realm of Ultramar by the same means. The three Primarchs were instrumental in the foundation of the Imperium Secundus as a means of continuing the fight against the traitors and securing the Emperor's great work. Giaman proclaimed Sanguinius as the rightful heir to the Emperor and declared him the new ruler of Imperium Secundus. Lionel Johnson was made the Lord Protector of this new Empire of Humanity and supreme commander of all of its military forces, a title that was similar to that of Warmaster. Unfortunately, the foundation of Imperium Secundus was marred when Kurz escaped from the Invincible Reason and rampaged across Macridge, intent on spreading as much terror and chaos as he could. Eventually, both Giaman and the Lion confronted the cornered Kurz. Their attempts to kill him were unsuccessful, however as the Night Lord's Primarch had laid a cunning trap. He brought down an entire chapel upon the two Primarchs through the use of planted explosives and fled the scene. Giaman and the Lion were only saved through the direct intervention of the loyalist Iron Warriors Warsmith Barabas Dantioch who was communicating with Giaman at the time of the attack through a portal that was opened by the Pharos. On instinct, the warsmith reached through the portal and pulled them to safety on Sotha. The Battle of Zapath Feeling directly responsible for the Night Haunter's rampage on Macridge, the Lion continued to obsessively hunt his wayward former brother for the next two Tehran years. In 11M31, he eventually was able to trace a slim lead on Kurz's whereabouts to the Zapath system, which had since fallen to the Word Bearers and World Eaters forces during their Shadow Crusade. Farith Redloss, the lieutenant-elect of the Dark Angel's Dread Wing, was charged with leading the hunt for Conrad Kurz upon the world of Zapath. The Dark Angels quickly uncover the horrors perpetrated by the Word Bearers for their dark rituals on that planet. 
Eventually, the Dark Angels took part in multiple engagements against the forces of both traitor legions, which culminated in the capital city of Numentis. The traitor forces were utterly annihilated by the victorious Dark Angels, and the world was left in the care of its surviving population. Meanwhile, Another detachment of Dark Angels under Captain Ormond reinforced the Space Wolves against the Alpha Legion of the Alaxas Nebula, while another under Causewain was tasked by the Lion with hunting down Callus Typhon following the Battle of Perditus. The Exile of the Lion while continuing his obsessive hunt for the elusive Night Haunter, the Lion and Giaman continuously clashed over policy, especially in regards to the security of Imperium Secundus. They were particularly vexed with how best to deal with the emergence of rebels on Macridge that the Lion was certain Kurz had instigated. Following a suicide bombing of an Astartes convoy, the Lion used the First Legion to establish martial law on Macridge. Certain that Kurz was hiding within the rebellious Illyrium region, he advocated the use of a massive orbital saturation bombardment of the region to ensure Kurz's death. Facing resistance from both Emperor Sanguinius and Guillermann, the Lion instead opted to deploy his legions Dreadwing in order to flush out Kurz and the rebels. During an attack on the city of Alma Mons, the Lion finally cornered the elusive Night Lord's Primarch and the two came to blows. After a brutal confrontation, the Lion eventually emerged victorious and questioned his brother why he had turned away from the Emperor, to which Kurz simply replied, Why not? Kurz went on to explain that there was a monster in his head that he could not stop. Though he finally had Kurz at his mercy, the Lion couldn't bring himself to kill his brother, and instead pummeled him again. He then ripped off Kurz's backpack from his battle plate, lifted him over his head, and brutally brought the Night Haunter down across his knee, breaking his spine and paralyzing him. The Lion brought the grievously wounded Conrad Kurz before Sanguinius and Giaman to stand trial. A triumvirate was later held where Kurz defended his actions, but refused to admit his guilt. Since each of the Primarchs had been created to perform a specific function, Kurz argued he was merely acting according to his own nature, and therefore had committed no crime. The Night Lord's Primarch further divided Guillermann and the Lion by accusing the latter of secretly ordering orbital bombardment in direct violation of Guillermann's orders to prevent civilian casualties. Enraged, the Lion sought to kill Kurz, but was halted by the words of Sanguinius as Guillermann snatched L. Johnson's Lion Sword and broke the blade across his armored thigh in his fury. L. Johnson was furious too, but Sanguinius dismissed the Lord Protector, ending the Triumvirate. The Lion was then banished from Imperium Secundus. Taking his leave, the Dark Angels withdrew from Macridge only hours later. Standing in the chamber of the Tuchulcha engine aboard the Invincible Reason, he brooded over recent events. He questioned his actions over the course of the last few decades, the banishment of Luther, the death of Nemiel, as well as other decisions he had come to regret. 
As the Dark Angels made their final preparations to depart back to Caliban, he went back to the Tatulcha engine's chamber. He ordered the device to teleport himself and Holgin, Deathbringer, the voted lieutenant of the Deathwing, back to Macridge. As Sanguinius prepared to execute Kurz for his crimes, both the lion and his lieutenant teleported directly into the chamber and told him to stop. As troops entered the room, demanding the lion's surrender, L. Johnson explained his reasons for the intrusion. He reasoned that Kurz had the ability to see precognitive visions of potential futures and repeated the Night Haunter's claim that his death would one day come at the hands of an assassin sent by the Emperor. If this was true, the Lion reasoned, then it was proof that the Emperor was still alive beyond the barrier of the ruined storm. Sanguinius knew the Lion's explanation rang true, as he recognized that his own precognitive visions of his inevitable death would also eventually come to pass. When Giaman demanded to know what would become of Kurz, the lion knelt before his two brothers and promised that he would be Kurz's jailer. Kurz remained captive aboard the Invincible Reason, and occasionally the lion would visit to speak with him in an attempt to gather information from his prophetic visions. But the Night Haunter rarely proved cooperative. The Second Battle of Davin In the wake of these revelations, Imperium Secundus was abolished by the Three Primarchs as an unfortunate mistake. The Three Primarchs led their legions in an attempt to breach the Ruined Storm and reach Tala to defend the Emperor now that they knew he still lived. Once in the Ruined Storm, the combined Loyalist fleet came across a variety of warp-born horrors and word of an entity spreading destruction known as the Pilgrim. Not even the Tuchalcha engine proved capable of navigating the ruined storm, which frustrated the lion. During the Battle of Piran, L. Johnson commanded Dark Angels Astartes as Sanguinius received a vision and realized that he needed to go where the Horus Heresy had truly begun, the world of Davin. Through an arduous journey, they eventually reached Davin, the nexus of the continuing ruined storm in real space, and engaged a vast, demonic host on and above the world in what would be remembered as the Second Battle of Davin. Reluctantly, Robert Giaman and the Lion agreed to trust in Sanguinius, but both had thought to simply destroy the hated world upon arriving from orbit. After the fleet emerged over Davin, Sanguinius shocked L. Johnson by boarding the Invincible Reason and taking the still captive Conrad Kurz with him. Sanguinius hoped to use Kurz's prophetic abilities to determine what he was meant to do upon Davin that could help to save the Emperor. He commanded a mass ground assault on the world, and the enraged lion nearly ordered that Davin be subjected to an exterminatus action regardless of Sanguinius's presence upon it. At the last moment, L. Johnson relented and was immediately horrified by what he had nearly done. He realized that some external power was attempting to force the Primarchs down the path to damnation, and he followed Sanguinius down to the surface. On that dusty world, Sanguinius was trapped within a portal to the warp 
and did battle with the demon Madail, while Giamon and the lion desperately tried to reach him. A vicious battle erupted both on Davin and above it in the void, where Giamon's acting flagship Summer Thrace was destroyed in orbit by the demon ship Veritas Ferum. During the ground battle at Davin's infamous Temple of the Serpent Lodge, where Horus had first been corrupted by chaos, Giamon and L. Johnson managed to finally fight as partners and brothers. Together they brought down a massive, soul grinder demon engine. Eventually, Sanguinius was able to escape, and the Space Marine forces evacuated the world to orbit. Davin was destroyed by cyclonic torpedoes, and with its anchor and real space gone, the demonic fleet vanished back into the Empyrean, and where Davin had once been, a breach in the ruined storm was now visible. The path through led directly to Terra, but upon further study, it became apparent that Horus had foreseen that this route might open for the Loyalists and had blocked it with a gauntlet of multiple traitor fleets. Giamon and the Lion agreed to distract the blockade while Sanguinius and the Blood Angel's fleet made directly for Terra, for that was their destiny. By the time the Siege of Terra began, the Lion hoped to draw traitor forces away from the throne world by striking at their own Legion homeworlds. As a result, the Dark Angels destroyed several traitor homeworlds such as Chemos of the Emperor's Children and Barbarus of the Death Guard, acts that the Lion would come to relish. The Passage of the Angels and the Crusade of Vengeance At some point before or during the Siege of Terror, the Astronomicon went dark for the Dark Angels' fleet. Fearing that Terra had fallen to Horus, L. Johnson became nihilistic, and instead of moving towards Terra, pledged himself to vengeance through the destruction of as much of the traitor's territory as he could. Using the rationalization of attacking the traitor homeworlds in hopes of drawing reinforcements away from Terra to his troops, he oversaw the destruction of Camos and Barbarus in a spiteful purge dubbed the Passage of the Angels. Without the Astronomicon, the Dark Angels continued to rely on the Tachalcha engine for guidance through the warp. The Lion eventually ordered the Dark Angels fleet to head to Deliverance the homeworld of the Raven Guard Legion, where Corvus Corax and Lehman Russ of the Space Wolves Legion were currently mustering their forces. The Lion was quick to question Corax's absence from the major fronts of the war, but his wrath was quickly extinguished by Russ, who pointed out that the Space Wolves' own survival was still an asset of great worth, even if Terra remained beyond their reach. Ross declared he would join L. Johnson's so-called Crusade of Vengeance, together with Space Wolves' warriors equipped with the new suits of Mark VI Corvus power armor produced on Kiavar. Yet Korax was cautious to commit his badly mauled legion to what he saw as a needlessly spiteful waste of resources for a purely emotional gain, and only assigned a small expeditionary force of the Raven Guard to accompany the Space Wolves and the Dark Angels. Eventually, the Dark Angels made course for Terra on the Lion's command, but arrived too late to influence the outcome of the siege or prevent the Emperor from being mortally wounded by Horus, 
and interred on the golden throne. The Return to Caliban L. Johnson, racked with grief over the inability of his dark angels to reach Tara in time to prevent the fall of the Emperor during the siege at the end of the Horus Heresy, returned to Caliban soon after the end of the siege for the first time in many standard years to reinforce his dark angels and recover from the shock of the heresy. Caliban had long been cut off from the main body of the Legion due to the effects of the Ruin Storm and the other tempests that had roiled the Immaterium during the worst days of the Horus Heresy. When the Dark Angels' void ships arrived in Calibanite orbit, they were fired upon by a savage salvo of defensive fire from the surface. The fleet pulled back and the lion tried to find out what was happening. He learned from a passing merchant ship that Luther had poisoned the mind of the space marine garrison on the world and taken control. It could only be seen by L. Johnson as the taint of chaos once more working its corruption, now upon the soul of his oldest friend and former mentor. The lion's fury was let loose, and the planet suffered. He ordered a systematic orbital bombardment of the planet to rid the world of chaos for all time. The planet burned, and its defenses were whittled down to nothing. Johnson led his forces personally against the defenders who had taken refuge in the Order's fortress monastery. The Lion found Luther and saw him to be completely corrupted by chaos, and almost nothing of his old friend had survived. Luther now a Chaos Champion, had been elevated to a strength equal to that of the Primarch through the Gifts of the Chaos Gods, and the two met in a duel the likes of which would not be seen again. They leveled the monastery around them, but the planet was also taking a heavy toll. The sustained bombardment began to crack the surface of its crust, the dark angels in orbit unable to see the damage they were wreaking upon their own homeworld. The Final Battle The battle between Luther and the Lion was truly titanic, but ended with a psychic attack which appeared to mortally wound L. Johnson. Luther then realized what he had done in his jealousy and anger, as if a veil of deceit had suddenly been lifted from in front of his eyes. He fell to the floor, unwilling to fight any more, but it was too late for L. Johnson. The enraged ruiner's powers of chaos realized they had lost control of yet another of their pawns, and sent a massive warp storm to rack the surface of the planet. It then broke apart under the strain, destroyed all but for the monastery of the Order which had been protected by potent defensive force fields. The rest of the Dark Angels who had been converted by Luther to the worship of Chaos were sucked into the warp and scattered across the galaxy. From that time forward, they were named the Fallen Angels, or simply the Fallen. The Fallen Angels were scattered throughout space and time, and Caliban tore itself apart under the strain of the Ruiner's power's assault. When the Dark Angels descended to what remained of Caliban, now little more than an asteroid upon which stood the Order's fortress monastery, they searched the ruins and found Luther mumbling that L. Johnson had been taken by the Watchers in the Dark, and would return one day and forgive him for his sins. 
the Dark Angels could not find any trace of their Primarch. The Fate of the Lion During his duel with Luther on Caliban, he suffered a severe psychic blow which left him mortally wounded. He was then briefly pulled into the raging warp vortex. Luther survived the contest, but proved mentally unhinged and was taken prisoner by the Dark Angels. He was then placed into a stasis cell deep within the bowels of the rock, the remains of the Order's mightiest fortress monastery and all that was left of their world, Caliban. To contemplate his crimes against the chapter's Primarch, his continued existence a secret known only to each successive Supreme Grand Master of the Dark Angels, whose cell can only be accessed through the use of the Sword of Secrets, the chapter artifact which is the mark of the Supreme Grand Master's office. L. Johnson, who had briefly spirited away into the warp during the destruction of Caliban, eventually emerged and was taken into a hidden and unreachable chamber deep within the heart of the rock by the Watchers in the Dark, and also placed into a dreamless sleep to keep him alive. This is a secret known only to the Emperor of Mankind himself who, despite his living death, still sees all upon the Golden Throne. Even the Supreme Grand Master of the Dark Angels was not privy to this last and greatest secret of the Dark Angel. Yet, some amongst them long whispered that one day, the Lion would return to lead one final crusade intended to achieve the Dark Angel's greatest victory for mankind and finally bring justice and redemption to the remaining fallen angels. None knew that this legend had more truth to it than they realized or that their lost Primarch long slept peacefully at the heart of their own fortress monastery. The Era Indomitus I will teach them to fear the darkness in which they dwell, and to dread the shadows they believe their allies. For there is no greater terror hunting the Stygian Void and the Lion of Caliban. In the era Indomitus, during the Arcs of Omen campaign, Lion L. Johnson awoke at last from his 10,000 year long sleep within the very heart of the rock. While his brother Primarch Robut Guillemin's forte lies in matters of command and administration, a task he accomplishes with a plum, Lionel Johnson was ever a warrior, a hunter and killer first and foremost, now awakened into a galaxy of darkness and insanity. He strides between the stars on a mission of vengeance. And yet, somehow, long before his return reached the ears of the wider galaxy, the Lion's legend had begun to spread from planet to planet within Imperial space. Disconnected worlds united by a mysterious figure who stalked from mist-wreathed passageways to cut down fearsome monsters like Chaff. Some knew him as the Cowled Giant, or the Unforgiving Knight, or even mistakenly as the Emperor Incarnate, and his arrival was always heralded 
by an apparition of ancient forests fading from the ether. The true nature of this empiric travel is known only to the Primarch himself, but as he lay slumbering beneath the rock, his dreams often returned to the Calibanite forests of his youth. Could he have been born in his restless sleep to other worlds by the ghosts of that same arboreal realm, slain in the destruction of Caliban? He is certainly not telling, but the practical applications of this ability to appear as if from nowhere through the warp are not lost on him. And to finish things off, the Lion's War Gear, first during the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy. The Leonine Panoply, the Lion wore a suit of artificer armor made to his exacting specifications known as the Lion Panoply. The Lion Helm, the Lion Helm is a sacred object of the Dark Angels chapter. It has been said to have been worn by Primarch Lionel Johnson and at present takes the form of a winged Mark VII Aquila power armor helmet. The helm is carried by a watcher in the dark. Built into the helmet is a protective force field which can be activated even when the helm is not being worn. The Lion Helm is currently worn by Supreme Grand Master Azrael. The Lion Sword The Lion Sword is L. Johnson's Great Sword. The sword was broken in antiquity and lost. It is now rumored to be carried by the mysterious fallen angel Cypher who seeks to reforge it and present it to the Emperor, obtaining absolution and forgiveness for all the fallen who wish it. And the Wolf Blade. The lion sometimes chose to wield a great two-handed chainsword known as an eviscerator that he named the Wolf Blade. And now for his war gear during the 41st millennium, the era Indomitus. He wore an artificer armor and he wielded fealty. This great Primarch sized power sword Crafted in the traditional style of the arming swords of the Knights of Lost Caliban, greatly enhances the lion's ability to engage in mass butchery. And the Emperor's shield. What truly marks Lionel Johnson out as a warrior of truly singular provenance isn't even his sword, but rather the Emperor's shield. This Oramite shield was once wielded by the Emperor himself, and aside from its indomitable protective powers, it reflects the force of any incoming attacks right back at the lion's foe with a sonorous boom.